here, so uh, you it's really by default you truncate the first sequence so you move vertically here, but you might uh, as well uh, go, have gone this way, so this uh, really doesn't matter and in fact points out that the longest common subsequence is usually not unique. Only the length, the maximal length is unique but uh, not the uh, subsequence itself. Okay, so what do we do if we have uh, three um, subsequences? Uh, how would you find the longest common subsequence of three sequences? Uh, so a sequence that is subsequence of all three of them and of longest possible length. Uh, you see, that is uh, the reason why I'm uh, uh, asking you that and consciously making you make a mistake is that you have to be really, really careful. Very often what looks like a tempting solution actually doesn't work and this is when we need proofs, right? Namely, one can show and in fact the reason for this is that uh, um, the uh, longest common subsequence is not uniquely determined but can have several solutions and if you pick the wrong one you can get in trouble. So the idea in which you first take longest common subsequence for the first two and then longest common subsequence from this solution and S3 does not work because uh, uh, here is an example of uh, um, longest common subsequences uh, uh, where in fact um, you can easily see here uh, the longest common subsequences in fact has four elements uh, but uh, taking it uh, um, by doing first uh, longest common subsequence of S1 and S2 and then doing it uh, for the result and S3 will in fact produce uh, a, uh, a shorter solution than, uh, than the optimal one. So you have to be really, really careful and uh, uh, we will do actually quite a few uh, problems with such traps so that uh, you get trained how to kind of be careful when uh, uh, choosing optimal solution. So instead of doing that, what do we do? How would you find the longest common subsequence for three sequences? Uh, how would you generalize the first algorithm that you've seen? So what did we do um, here? So if we had a match, we add one and take the solution for uh, the truncated uh, uh, subsequences. If uh, there is no match between the endpoints, you try to get rid of the one and keep the other uh, intact, and then you switch and uh, keep uh, the first inta int intact and second truncated. If you have three sequences, how will this recursive definition look like? Mm, yep, it will be a 3D array, so it will be a, uh, a, a cubicle, right? It, so what will be the recursion? Do you have to, so now you have three entries. Uh, do you have to consider whether the first two symbols match and then maybe the third one is different or there is actually only one case when you can... Uh, increase the length for one. When can you increase the length for one if uh, the if you have three of them? Hmm? Exactly, if all three agree. So if only two match, it's no good, right? So only if uh, the endpoints of all three subsequences agree, then you find the solution for the three truncated sequences 
if they don't agree, if, meaning that not all three of them are equal, it doesn't matter whether two are equal or, and uh, one is not, uh, what you do is you systematically peel off the, the last element of the first and you keep the second two uh, intact. Then you keep first intact, peel off last element of the second, and you keep the third intact. And finally, you keep the first two intact and peel off the element, the last element of the third, and you pick whichever is uh, the longest of the three, again, breaking evens in any way uh, you like. So be careful that uh, um, always verify that you, in fact, do find uh, um, that you do find optimal solution. Okay, how do we find the shortest common super se sequence? So what is a common super sequence? It's the sequence so that both S and S star are subsequences of that sequence and it's of shortest possible length. How would you solve this? Let me give you a hint. You can reduce this problem to the longest common subsequence. How would you reduce finding shortest common super sequence to finding longest common subsequence? So you have two sequences. You want to find a longer sequence so that both Sequences are subsequences of the longest, comma of the, sorry of the shortest common subsequence, right? So they have to be both subsequences, uh, but the, uh, the the solution has to be as short as possible. How is the longest common subsequence related to this solution? What does the longest common subsequence allow you to do? I mean, the easiest way to do it uh, would be take one sequence and concatenate the other one onto that, right? But why would be this wasteful? If both sequences were diff uh, had no uh, letters in, uh, no symbols uh, uh, shared between the two, if they were on completely different, built from different sequences, would there be anything better than just taking one and concatenating the other? No, obviously. So what do we want to utilize? If there is some overlap, then you can use it twice, once for the first sequence and once again for the second sequence, right? And if you want your resulting sequence to be as short as possible, what do you want to maximize? Exactly, the longest overlap, right? So what is then the way, how do we do this? Well, you simply find the longest common subsequence of S and S star, and then you simply insert whatever is missing, right? In any order you want. So for example, here is, uh, here are the two sequences, and as you can see, the, it's easy to verify that the longest common subsequence is B, C, A, D. Here it is also B, C, A, D. So you take B, C, A, D and then you insert whatever is missing in any order you want. So you take B and then you insert A and X from the left, right? And then between B and C you have to insert Y and you have to insert A. You can insert it in any way any order you want, right? And um, you keep doing that uh, uh, till you reach the end of the <coughs> subsequence, right? In this way, you maximize the overlap, so you maximize the subsequence that can be reused for both of them, right? So that you don't have to repeat. So it's very logical, right? So that's a nice example. Okay, so now what we want to do is apply dynamic programming 
to graph theory, right? And uh, so what algorithm do you use if you have weighted graph, right? So a graph directed weighted graph. So all the edges uh, have certain weights associated with them. How do you find the shortest path between U and V? Which algorithm do you use? You must have covered this in uh, Dijkstra's algorithm. Have you done Dijkstra's? Yeah, so you use Dijkstra's algorithm. But Dijkstra works only if all the um, uh, edges have positive weight. Uh, so how does it operate? Oh gosh, no ammunition. Ah, here it is. So if you have a graph, right, and uh, you have a vertex U, how do we start it? Well, you look at all outgoing edges uh, from U and you pick the shortest one. Now the claim is that this must be the shortest path between U and say this is some vertex V. Why is this the case? Why can be some shorter path, for example, going here and then going here and then going here? If this is the shortest edge that uh, leaves uh, U, why is this always shorter than this path? It is, we pick the edge of smallest length. So the length of this edge is smaller or equal to that edge here. So then you have some additional land here, so this can never be shorter than direct path between U and V. And then you do this uh, adding one vertex at a time. If you, you, right, you create a set, and now for all paths to all of the vertices from S, you look at all edges, outgoing edges, and you pick one so that that is of the shortest length and you do this over all uh, vertices in S and you pick the smallest one, right? And then it's easy to see that uh, um, this produces the shortest path between uh, you and uh, any of the vertices, so consequently also the vertex that you are searching for. But notice this argument uh, uh, depends heavily on the fact that the weights are positive. Because say if this weight was negative, uh, say this was three, uh, this was four, still this path now has shorter uh, total weight because four minus one is uh, three, minus two is one, so this part becomes shorter than the path between U and V. So the Dijkstra algorithm breaks down. So we want to find the shortest path in a graph that can have negative weight edges. When does such shortest path always exist? What graphs cannot have the shortest path at all between some of the elements? Hmm? No, well, uh, then uh, the shortest path between two unconnected components will be of infinite length, right? But uh, what is, if the, in what case uh, can it happen that you have two vertices uh, from which you can find uh, uh, a path of arbitrarily small length? Now notice, what does it mean, small length? Uh, if you have negative edges, when will you have um, arbitrarily small length path between the two vertices? Uh, exactly, if there exists a negative weight uh, cycle, because if you reach the cycle, you can go 
uh, around as many times uh, as you want and accumulate as, uh, uh, as small number as possible because small for negative numbers means large by absolute value, just by negative. So if you have a cycle of negative length, uh, you cannot guarantee that between arbitrary two points there is a, a path of uh, uh, the shortest possible path. However, if there are no um, cycles of negative uh, uh, length, then the problem is well defined and you can uh, in fact um, find the shortest path between any two vertices and an interesting feature of this algorithm is that it was probably if not the very first but then among the very first uh, problems that was that introduced dynamic programming in uh, early 50s uh, right by Bellman Bellman is the guy who actually well, several people about the same time came up with similar idea, but usually Bellman is considered to be the first to propose dynamic programming as general method. Right, so how do we solve this uh, um, problem if there are no um, negative length loops? Now, my claim is, uh, if there are no negative length loops, then the shortest path uh, between two vertices is, can be chosen to, uh, is non-self-intersecting. What does it mean? It means that it doesn't have loops, right? Because uh, if there is a loop, uh, but there is no negative weight loop, uh, why can I find a shorter path? What can I do? If I have a path that involves a loop and there is no loop that has total negative weight, then how am I, why am I guaranteed that there is a shorter path than one that has a loop? Exactly, I can simply delete the loop and because the length of the loop is positive, the total length of the loop is positive, what I get is uh, a shorter path, right? So the shortest path is not, cannot be self-intersecting, has no uh, loops involved. But if the total gra if, uh, graph G has, uh, so V E, if uh, V has uh, N vertices, uh, then how many edges can there be in a non-self-intersecting path? What's the largest number of edges that can be involved? If you have n vertices, what is the longest path in terms of number of edges? Not forget about weights. What's uh, uh, the longest uh, non the longest path that involves no loops, how long can it be at most? N minus one, of course, right? So the total length is N minus one. Now this is used in the dynamic programming construction and the construction contains uh, another uh, trick that is very frequently used in algorithm design which is called relaxation. So what is the, what is the, the procedure? You see, sorry? <laughs> okay, soon the semester will be over and then we will all go outside and relax. So, um, uh, let me see, what was I about uh, to say? Uh, aha, okay. So we are now considering, uh, so we want to find the shortest path between a vertex S 
and the vertex T. We are going to use dynamic programming to solve the following sub-problems. For every vertex U distinct from T, we are going to find the length minimal, the shortest path, so opt, um, and I'll tell you what I is, U, this is the length of shortest path from U to T. U is an arbitrary vertex, but such that the number of legs, the number of edges, so I was too generous with squingling here. Let me make it, so here is, uh, right? So this is a shortest path, right? But I constrain it so that the number of edges is smaller or equal than I. So this is the shortest path from vertex U to our destination vertex T, such that shortest in terms of some total of all weights of all edges, such that the total number of uh, edges is uh, smaller or equal than I. Uh, so what is then uh, the final, what is the quantity that I'm really interested in? Opt. And then what sits here and what sits here? If I'm looking for the shortest path altogether, regardless of how many edges involved, from S to T. What sits here and what sits here? So this is from U to T. So what is the second input here? S, exactly. Now, what can I put here so that actually I don't get, so that it's totally non-constraining. N minus one, very good. So N minus one, because any non-self-intersecting path can have at most N minus one edges, right? So this is what I am looking for, and the recursive, Computation is for every fixed i, uh, so we fix i, and then we range with u over the entire graph and find optimal uh, shortest path from u to t, but with extra constraint that it cannot have more than i edges. So as i grows, the constraint becomes looser and looser, right? Because if I put here i plus one, then I allow also paths that have length, that have i plus one many edges. So at the end, you see this solution is a relaxation of opt um, i s, right? Uh, because here I constrain the solution to be optimal, the shortest path from S to T, but contains, that contains at most I edges. And as I increases, the constraint gets relaxed, right? So the optimal solution will be then fine. Now, the reason why I do this extra constraint would be what? What do you think? Why putting this extra constraint? Why do we always introduce sub-problems when we do dynamic programming? Exactly, to get a simple recursion, right? Because it's very easy to see how to recurse, right? Um, and it is based on the following observation. We have to have this uh, uh, optimal solution uh, property, right? If I have a shortest path from a vertex U that goes from U to P and then here to some Q and then God knows where, 
uh, eventually reaches t, I claim that if this is the shortest path from u to t, then the shortest path from p to t is just this truncation. Why is this so? Why if uh, this longer path is optimal solution for u, why if I truncate it, if I throw away u and start from p, why this remains optimal solution for p? Exactly. Always the same trick, yeah, right? Cut and paste ar argument. Assume that there is something better, a shorter path to three. Well, in this case, if I add uh, edge up, right? I add both the same quantity to both this path and that path. So if this path has shorter length, then this path would be a better solution than my alleged optimal solution from u to t. So this allows us to build recursively optimal solutions from, uh, uh, for uh, sub-problems from optimal solutions for smaller size uh, sub-problems. So what is the recursion? The recursion looks like this, you see. Sorry, this is kind of messy. I don't know why this got... Uh, so it says simply that optimal solution from i uh, using limitation i, the bound for the number of edges, from a vertex v is the smallest of opt i minus 1 v and the minimal uh, sum when you have opt i minus 1 up to certain um, uh, p, and then uh, the shortest path from, uh, I mean, and then the edge from uh, uh, v to p, right? So essentially what it says, I look for uh, optimal solutions from other vertices, but of what length? You see now, you distinguish two cases. Uh, first case, maybe optimal solution from u uh, to t actually has uh, smaller than i many edges. In this case, uh, optimal solution is already uh, obtained uh, by this expression, right? Because this is optimal solution uh, from v to t that has at most i minus one edges. Uh, so you will choose this, uh, of course, this will be the solution if optimal solution from v to t, in fact, uh, has at most i minus one edges. But then you test, uh, maybe in fact, optimal solution here is achieved for a path with i vertices. Then you simply try all possible choices for the first destination, right? So it will be, optimal solution that has at most i minus one many edges. Why? Because we will add an edge that contains, uh, that connects v uh, to p. So you look for all, so if you want to find optimal solution with at most i many edges to t, you simply test for all possible other vertices in the graph you look for optimal solution that, have, that has at most i minus one edges. And consequently, it was already obtained in the previous stage of iteration because the sub-problems are all ordered. So the solution for opt, right, will be, this is one, this is two, these are the lengths. Eventually, it's uh, n minus one. And so you have here opt i uh, v will be for all possible v's in the graph. So v ranges for as, through as many vertices as you have in the graph. But you look for optimal solution from that vertex to t that has at most a i legs, right? So if you are doing it uh, 
Uh, if you want to find this, you can look here. You already have in the table i minus 1 p for, our, for all possible p is in the graph. And you simply try to extend the shortest path with this edge. You take the shortest of all, and lo and behold, this will be optimal solution for IV. So you see the co extra constraint that we gradually relax allows you simple recursion because you can build shortest paths from shortest paths of length one smaller, right, by simply looking as at total length and extending it with the weight of the edge up. If you range through entire uh, graph, of course, you will find the finally optimal solution from i to all, um, uh, from i from v to, uh, from all v's into um, vertex, uh, vertex t, right? So simply you let p range over the entire graph. You take optimal solutions, extend them with the weight of this edge, and you take mean over everything. And of course, this will give you optimal solution for, um, for uh, when you allow i many edges. So this is. Bellman Ford. So in this way, you notice here we fixed uh, the last vertex t. So this is short, it will produce shortest paths from any vertex in the graph to a specified vector, to specified vertex t. But now the very same trick can be used to actually find all pairs, uh, shortest paths. So, uh, and this is uh, another famous algorithm, uh, floyd Warshall algorithm that was also independently discovered by several people, but uh, floyd Warshall uh, stuck um, uh, in the name. Okay, so again you have a graph with set of vertices V and set of edges, edges E, right? And, uh, uh, because of the way how the algorithm operates, we will enumerate, say it has n edges, so we will in any order, I mean in any way, you simply enumerate all n edges, uh, sorry, all n vertices. Uh, so assumption is again that there are no negative weight loops. In this case, uh, you can um, use a similar idea to obtain the shortest path from every vertex Vp to every other vertex Vq. And the idea is, again, relaxation. You constrain the sub-problems so that they allow simple recursion. What will be the constraint? Um, you are going to recursively compute optimal solution from any ver vertex Vp to any vertex Vq, right? Such that, so here will be um, your vertex Vp. Here is vertex Vq. And you will find shortest paths with the following constraint in ith stage of recursion. You will allow intermediate paths, uh, intermediate vertices, uh, to be only from the set from vertex V1 up to vertex VI. So all of these intermediate points, uh, so this is some vertex V, uh, say M1, Vm2, uh, all the way here is some Vmk. Well, all of these vertices that are intermediate vertices on the path are constrained to be among first i vertices. 
right? So we are making our life more complicated, but uh, the benefit is that the recursion now becomes extremely simple. So how do we recursively compute the uh, optimal solution if you constrain uh, the solution to first k many vertices? Well, maybe optimal solution when you constrain the, the intermediate vertices to uh, first k vertices, maybe it actually doesn't use k vertex. Maybe simply optimal solution uh, from Vp to Vq, the shortest path between Vp and Vq, so that the intermediary vertices are among V1 up to Vk, simply never use the vertex Vk, right? In this case, uh, opt solution k minus 1 Vp Vq will already produce this, uh, um, this optimal solution here. However, if it really contains the kth vertex, uh, then you simply, so you see, if you now look for optimal solution, and it turns out it does use a vertex vk. Well, but then it's easy because such optimal solution if you take truncation from Vp to Vk, it must be an optimal path from Vp to Vk, right? And every Vk can appear only once because we remember we argued that there can be no loops in the shortest path because there are no negative value loops. This is where we use it. Vk can appear at most once. But then the path between the Vp to Vk contains only uh, vertices from V1 up to Vk minus 1. And the path between, from Vk to Vq it also contains only vertices from this set. But this means that if I find the sum of these two optimal paths, I'll get the optimal path for Vp, Vq. So in both cases, so this is simply the first leg to reach Vk, and this is from Vk to Vq, but these must have been produced in the previous stage of uh, uh, iteration, right? So either you already got optimal solution because Vk does not ex is not used, if Vk is used simple enough, optimal solution must be simply sum of shortest path from Vp to Vk plus shortest path from Vk to reach uh, Vq. And uh, in this way, as we gradually relax, eventually if we put here n, right, if we go all the way to Vn, we will find globally optimal solution between Vp and VQ. And notice this runs in a cubic uh, uh, amount of time, right? Because we have to, uh, we have constraints between uh, uh, containing um, uh, zero intermediate edges, uh, sorry, vertices uh, up to how many? Two less because we have uh, P VP and VQ, so up to uh, N minus two uh, here. So altogether, because there are quadratically many pairs, uh, and for each k, you have to fill the entire table, right, with optimal solutions uh, for k minus 1, so the runtime will be cubic. Uh, how would you detect? Assume that you, I give you a graph, a directed graph, and you have no idea whether it has loops or uh, of negative weight, or it doesn't have. How can you use this algorithm to detect negative weight loops? What you have to do is you run the, your algorithm. 
from VP you add also so that the ends can be the, uh, the same uh, here again to uh, VP, right? And if you find a loop, uh, then uh, when you look at your tables, you just look at the diagonal um, and see if uh, for any of the vertices, the shortest path was negative, right? From VP to VP. So you get, uh, so in this way, with uh, this slight extension allowing that the starting and finishing vertex can be the same, you can detect the um, presence of uh, loops of negative weight. So these are two really, really extremely important algorithms. Let's make a short break now and then we will continue with more problems. Please read the notes carefully. Sure, sure, sure. Maybe you won't ever need an extra vertex, right? So it simply says test first how big is that, and then test all of these. If mean of these is larger than that one, then you simply default to this, right? Because this one adds an extra uh, element to the, to the path. you constrain what intermediary vertices you can use. Right? You constrain them to be only among the first part. And this allows you, of course, what you are looking for then is the object um, over all possible vertices of the intermediary, right? Uh, from any two vertices P and Q. But this is part of the problem, so instead you restrict this to, to allow only first I many vertices as intermediate. Now, if you add another vertex, then optimal 
You can, but it's kind of messier, and the reason, um, first, it's a historic reason, but also it gives you, you can do, in fact, you can tweak Bellman core to get more wow show, yeah. uh, but uh, this kind of makes it cleaner example of the, right, so of the method. It was just to illustrate two yes, different yes, ideas yes, rather yes, than yeah, 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 people yeah. tell that. Yeah, yeah, you can, there is, a, there is a tweak to Bellman core to make it work. Uh, but uh, this, it's not I as clean do, as you this. You can do exactly the same thing, right? Just you have to, so if you're doing optimal pi, let's say you're doing the optimal part from S to P with have no pi moves. Yeah, 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 Or you yeah, do a course. table of the out sure, 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 yeah. sure. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Right, okay, I'll just check. Then, whatever the optimal solution here, you 
Okay, guys. Time to start working again before you can relax, right? Okay, so edit distance. Uh, this is another important algorithm uh, for, uh, for practical applications. So you are given two text strings, A of length N and B of length M. You want to transform from A to B. Um, and you are allowed to either insert a character into uh, what you are doing with A, right, into intermediate result, or you can delete a character or you can replace one character by another character, right? Um, so two, two words are similar if it takes a very few, uh, if, you, if all costs, uh, both for deletion, for replacement and insertion are just one, then this is how uh, when you misspell a word, how a spell checker uh, suggests uh, what, is, what should be replaced, uh, uh, with what word you should replace it, uh, right? Uh, the one that is closest in the sense of added distance. Now, if you mistype something into Google search box, uh, what do you think? Does Google use this algorithm to suggest what's the right... Uh, solution. No, what does it suggest? <laughs> you know, it's very, very clever what uh, Google does. It uses so-called collaborative filtering. If you mistype something, in all likelihood you are not the first one to mistype. The person before you realize his mistake and change it into the correct spelling. So Google memorizes for every misspelled word that is not in the dictionary, what was the next word that users would search for. So without, because this is actually quite a costly algorithm, but uh, uh, you see Google uses this, I guess what they call it nowadays, big data, right? It has a record of what users uh, uh, have done after uh, misspelling a word how they corrected it, and this is what uh, uh, it suggests to you. But uh, um, if you are all alone, and if you are so lousy with spelling like myself, then this is the algorithm that, uh, the, uh, that uh, your spell checker uh, uses. Now, what do you think, what's the reason, why do we allow different costs for insertion, deletion, and replacement? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, here you see it doesn't uh, pen it penalize for as long as you insert whatever you insert uh, it uh, actually penalizes you equal amount. But let me give you a hint. This with different costs is used in biology. Why do you think uh, 
uh, biologists would like to, if you are comparing two strings of DNA, why do you want to penalize differently for uh, excising something, for, for deleting something, for inserting or for replacing? Exactly, because the probabilities of insertion and deletion uh, uh, and replacement uh, are n of one nucleotide with another one, they are not of equal probability. And your distance, uh, you want your distance to reflect probability to have such a mutation. Okay, so how do we solve this problem? So now, first kind of step with uh, here is to notice the following property. So you start with A, okay? And you want to somehow to transform it uh, uh, eventually into B. I claim you can do that uh, moving from left to the right, which means if I did here either an insertion, deletion, or replacement, I never have to do it uh, uh, on the left-hand side of uh, this point, right? Simply because the, the effect is the same, right? It's commutative, so to speak, in which order you do the changes, you can always do the changes only from left to right and never going back, right? So that's an important observation because it allows us now to make a, a simple recursion. But notice uh, it's a two-dimensional problem and you will be looking at the costs of transforming any truncation of I into any other truncation up to j of the second sequence. So actually you are filling up a pretty large table. If you have m characters in a, in a and uh, k characters in b, then the size of the table is, uh, uh, because you start with the empty string, it's m plus one times uh, n plus one, right? So this is why this is actually pretty expensive uh, program and uh, algorithm. And this is why Google, in fact, uses this uh, collaborative filtering uh, to suggest uh, changes. And so we solve recursively uh, for minimal cost transformation from the truncation of up to first I uh, symbols of A into first um, J symbols of B. So you always operate only on uh, truncations of uh, A to reach uh, B. So this gets, uh, this is kind of frozen, right, uh, the target. And what is the recursion? Well, if you have your sequence AI, and you want to trans transform it into a sequence BJ. Because of this feature that you can do it from left to right, you have only the follow. You see, we don't have to consider uh, what happens if you do a replacement uh, uh, somewhere inside the AI, uh, A from one to I, right? You can always operate only on the very last symbol because you can always do this transformation moving from uh, left to right. You over, always operate uh, on, uh, uh, from left to right, and you don't ever go back to modify. So then you, are, uh, then you have the following options. <coughs> you can delete the last element, uh, a, uh, i-th element in A, and look what is the cost to transform this truncated uh, version up to i minus one into whole of j, right? Or you have an option to um, transform i into sequence up to b j minus one, right? 
and then append the last element uh, uh, of B, right, that you are missing uh, for the cost of the cost of insertion. So here you have the cost of deletion of one element, here you have the cost of insertion of one element. Or, so we took care, so the options were either as I am transforming from here, say, to here, I can either delete this element and then transform a truncated sequence into B, or what I can do is uh, I can transform the entire sequence into B that goes all the up to uh, J minus one and then append the very last element to get B up to J or I can uh, swap the very last element and if I do that then if the endpoints agree if AI is equal to B uh, J then of course there is no penalty because you do nothing right if uh, um, the last element agree you simply will uh, do will first transform A up to uh, I minus one into B up to J minus one and then uh, uh, the very last element uh, of A will be uh, present and uh, you don't have to do anything about it. Uh, or um, uh, you transform I minus one to J minus one and then you replace the very last element in case AI is not equal to BJ, right? Then you transform uh, A up to I minus one into B uh, J minus one. And of course, uh, then automatically, in this case, automatically you get also the transformation of the sequence, of the whole sequence because the last element already matched, right? Or here, uh, if the last element is different after you finish the transformation from A I minus one up to J minus one, then you simply swap the very last element A I, you replace it with B J to get B J. Yeah? And of course you take the cheapest of, uh, of all the costs. And this is your recursive solution for I plus one. So notice this is yet another example of exhaustive search. Even the graph algorithms that we uh, had here, right, for example, here we search through all possible, uh, say in Bellman Ford, we search over the entire graph what this uh, second element might be. So it's uh, an exhaustive search, but only the recursion step is exhaustive, and, uh, but the whole uh, operation the whole algorithm is not because the work is not uh, repeated, right? We, we store the solutions to subproblems into a table. Okay, so here is another interesting example. So you are given a sequence of numbers and some arithmetic operations between them. Your task is to place brackets in such a way so that the resulting uh, expression has the largest possible value. And so you have to tell me how to do that. You've seen enough dynamic programming to be able to fix this one. So how would you find how to place the brackets to, so that uh, with that placement of br the brackets, this expression has attains largest possible value. What will be sub problems? What do you think? Hmm? Uh, what, uh, will it be one dimensional or two dimensional table? What does this remind you of placing the brackets? Matrix multiplication, very good. So in matrix multiplication, we found optimal placement between uh, numbers uh, uh, AN and A, 
between ai up to aj. So what we are going to look at, right, um, if these are numbers uh, n1 and then some operation here, uh, let's denote it like this, n2, some operation here, n3, some operation here, and so forth, some operation, uh, oops, say n k minus one, operation n k. So the sub-problem will be, you, we are going to solve, so p i j is, uh, uh, will be for the sig string uh, n i, operation n i plus one, operation, operation n j, operation n, uh, sorry, n j minus one, n j. But, so it will be truncations both from the left and from the right. In order to maximize this, Will it be, oh, so the idea would be maybe now I can try in all possible way to break into two, find max here and max here, and just uh, see what is the result. Would this be enough? So if you truncate this, uh, is it always true that the max of this expression is max of this side, and then operation, whatever it is, max of that side. No. What are the offending operations that do not respect this? Negative, exactly. If you have subtraction, if this guy is a minus, then it won't help you. Then you have to find max of this, but mean of that, right? So what will be then sub-problems? Uh, Pij will be finding what? Pij is, uh, uh, will be max of, uh, so optimal placement of brackets to get max of uh, this, uh, right? And also mean of that, uh, and i up to n j, right? Because now the recursion is trivial, depending what is, uh, how do we, uh, how do we now solve the problem? When will this expression have max value and when will it have minimal value? Minimal value will be when this is uh, as small as possible and this as large as possible. And maximal value will be when this is large as large as possible and this as small as possible. So this allows you very simple recursion providing that you solve both for the mean and the max then you will search for all k, right? You will find the, the max of that this can be achieved by searching through uh, all k here, right? Where, where you break this into two and you will search for both max, where do, do you break it? And obviously the partial solutions will be already present in the table because the length of the sequences uh, are shorter. So you will find uh, what is the largest value that you can get. You will get one position of the brackets for the largest value of this, another position of the brackets for the largest value of that, Right, uh, um, and this will be done using this recursion. Is it clear how we go about it? Uh, right, so you solve uh, two problems, right? For every 
substring from i to j, you find uh, how to break it into two so that uh, uh, you produce the largest value, but also you find how to break it to produce minimal value because the recursion actually uses both mean of this uh, and max of that, mean of this and max of that, depending on what is the operand between the two. So that sometimes is kind of tricky how to generalize the problem so that you allow a simple uh, recursion. Okay, let's see. The turtle tower, this is my favorite problem. It's probably among the toughest that, uh, uh, and it's part of your homework, surprise, surprise. So you are given a bunch of turtles of all things, right? And your task is to stack them So you are given a whole bunch of turtles. Uh, if you didn't know what the turtles look like, that's exactly what they are like. And for each turtle ti, uh, you are given its uh, weight. So sorry, it should be the other way around. So you are given weight of ti and you are given strength of ti. Yeah? So what is the weight? Weight of the turtle is simply the, its weight. Strength of ti yeah, is how much weight you can put on top of it without cracking uh, its uh, shell, right? Your task is uh, to build as high tower of turtles as you can with as many turtles as possible. Don't ask me why you want to do such thing in your life, uh, right? So that, so it's the highest possible tower so that uh, no turtle gets cracked uh, in the process. Uh, you see, what is the difficult part of this problem? The difficult part is that you have two kind of incompatible parameters, right? Uh, you want to put uh, turtles that are strong on the bottom. And you want to put turtles that are light on top. Because closer to the top it is, uh, then this turtle will uh, uh, will be uh, will count uh, with as with largest number of turtles, right? So, for example, this turtle uh, is uh, its weight is borne by by both this turtle and that turtle, while this one is borne by all subsequent uh, turtles. So, one idea would be you would like to put turtles that are light towards the top and turtles that are strong towards the bottom. But then what if uh, a turtle is both light and strong? Where do you put it? You have only one of each. Uh. Ah, if you multiply its weight by the strength. Guess what, you are on a very, very good try, uh, path, but this time it's not a product. It is the sum. So the hint that I gave you is, so now this is, why is this an important problem? In order to do recursion, you have to have a, a linear ordering. 
right? Even in two-dimensional case, we have linear ordering, uh, essentially, like geographically, because we fill usually the table row by row and then partially fill it for the very last row. So here, it is not clear how to order turtles because they have two parameters, uh, weight and the strength. So first hurdle in any dynamic programming is figuring out what is the ordering that has the following property. You see, no ordering can preserve all solutions. But you just have to make sure that if you order these turtles, in general, your subproblems, in certain way, uh, then at least one among optimal solutions will be found that respects the ordering, uh, right? So the first step, you ask me, what is the general kind of uh, uh, strategy when you do dynamic programming? Well, uh, here it is, the first step is always um, find the ordering uh, that allows you to build solutions to larger sub-problems uh, from the solutions for smaller sub-problems, right? And here the hint is, so the first step is always uh, find how to order uh, your universe. And the second step that is also tricky in this problem is uh, how to generalize Uh, the problem to allow uh, easy recursion. Okay, so so here, so how how to order your universe uh, so that. Uh, at least uh, one optimal solution uh, can be obtained by recursion, right? So ordering your universe will necess necessarily restrict your choices. And the trick is to do that so that you don't lose all of the optimal solutions. So let's see what happens in with the turtles. And for the second part, I'll let you struggle uh, yourselves. I'll give you a hint and then uh, so claim uh, if uh, we order uh, turtles by weight of ti plus strength of ti uh, in a increasing order, uh, then for every k, if there exists uh, a, a solution of height k, Uh, then 
uh, there is a solution uh, a solution such that uh, weight of S i plus one sorry weight of T i plus one Uh, weight of T i plus 1 plus strength of T i plus 1 is always bigger or equal than weight of T i plus strength of T i. So the claim is the claim is, uh, let's see a picture and it will be then clear. So the claim is that if you have a solution of height k, right, then you can find, uh, you can find a turtle tower of exactly the same order k, such that if you look at uh, ti and you look at ti plus one, notice, so this is order just in increasing order as they appear in the tower, not uh, as they are just listed originally. Then you can always find a solution so that uh, strength of ti, so that this one always has strength plus weight larger or equal than strength plus uh, weight of any of the preceding ones. So this guarantees that if you do ordering or of turtles, if you do ordering of turtles in this way, and you always find the solution, say, optimal solution, uh, then you see in any, if, if you do this in stages, always adding uh, solutions to the bottom, right, you can always find the same height solution in which the turtles do in fact have this property, the strength plus weight of Ti plus one is bigger or equal than strength of Ti plus weight of ti. So maybe some of the, if I do always, if I build these towers in this order, right, if, my, uh, if in the tower the, the turtle satisfy this, then whenever I have a solution of certain height, I will always get, there must be also a solution in which the height plus weight of the turtle increases, uh, is non-decreasing, uh, right? How do we show that this is in fact the case? Uh, well, assume that in the original tower, uh, there is a turtle here, say this is turtle uh, A, and somewhere here is turtle B that are inverted. So assume that S of A plus weight of A is larger than strength of B plus strength of, um, sorry, plus weight of B, right? What would, the, what would be the easiest situation to get this tower? The easiest situation is if you can permute these very turtles. So you simply change the ordering of the turtles, but not which turtles are present, right? Now, we would like, whenever we have an inversion, we would like to swap. But the problem is now when you do the swapping, you have to verify that none of the, not only if you put A here, but also none of the intermediate turtles will crack. And that's pain. So what do we do? 
the same trick all over again. Huh? Adjacent. Adjacent, exactly. If there are turtles that are out of order, there must be two adjacent turtles that are out of order, and we can swap them. And if we do that, if we show that the swapping of adjacent turtles uh, preserves uh, the fact that the tower will not crack, then of course by bubble sorting, right, we can eventually rectify all inversions and get one that um, uh, that is completely monotonic in terms of sum of the weight plus strength. Okay, so then what we can assume is uh, instead of looking at turtle A and turtle B, we can look at two consecutive turtles, say T i and T i plus one. And let's assume that in fact there is an inversion, namely that strength plus weight of i turtle is strictly bigger than this one. We want to show that if I swap them, right, no turtle with, will crack. Now if I swap these two, which, what, situa what turtles will see different weights above them? Only these two, right? Because if they are adjacent, nothing happens on top, nothing happens on the bottom. So I only have to show that uh, these two will not crack. Is it possible that Ti will crack after swapping? Uh, sorry, that Ti plus one will crack? No, because if it goes on top, it will see only the smaller weight. So now we have to show that if we swap, then the uh, turtle Ti will not be, uh, t the turtle Ti, so have to show uh, Ti will not crack. How do you spell crack? C-R-A, C-K, right? Sorry, I'm not good with turtles. <laughs> okay, so we have to show that uh, lo and behold, uh, uh, this uh, will be the case. And you know what? I have terrible ear infection and it's starting to drive me really crazy. So why don't you think about this uh, uh, till Friday, and then uh, I'll give you more hints if you are still stuck. Let's call it off for the day. <laughs>